All right. Hello, everybody. We are live. <laughs> I see that we have some friends here already. Earlier. Oh, look at this, Peg. Somebody's Oops. been watching your videos. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, oh. welcome. <laughs> I see lots of people from the Discord here. I was trying to think of a great prize for you, Kate. I was like, I should think of something witty, and I just couldn't come up with anything, but it sounds like Leslie came up with a really good one. You win a hug from Leslie. That's a great prize. I would take that prize. Right? <laughs> she had asked, is there a prize for being the first person here? Okie dokie, guys. Um, I think you guys can probably see us by now. I've noticed sometimes there's a lag in the beginning. Um, so, okay. So, I'm just going to get going on our announcements. But if you guys would like to share your thoughts. Oh, first I should tell you what this is, right? This is the third The Brothers K Karamazov live stream. Uh, this one is going to be discussing books. Uh, sorry. Five through seven. Yes, five through seven. Yes, and anything pertinent from one to four. So if you want to talk about earlier things, that's fine. Um, and so for first time readers, what we really want to know here is how convincing were Ivan's arguments in the chat to you personally? Um, there's a lot of discussion about this in the Discord and like among us, you know, co-hosts here. So um, I'm just going to do a few announcements, have my co-hosts introduce themselves. Please tell us your thoughts. How convincing were Ivan's arguments throughout book five? Um, and that, that includes things other than the Grand Inquisitor, but of course it includes the Grand Inquisitor. So yeah, we'll be talking about that a lot tonight. So that's what we'll talk about first, but get the announcements out of the way. So um, first of all, uh, make sure that you join the Literary Discourse Discord for more discussion with us and with other people who are reading along with us. The Discord is linked down below. Um, and we'll have future read-alongs there as well, so definitely check that out. And lots of Brothers Karamazov 2021 stuff there. That is our hashtag, by the way, hashtag Brothers Karamazov 2021. So if you want to talk about us um, anywhere, this read-along, you can use the hashtag. Um, so, And also, our next live stream will be on March 18th at 7 p.m. EST, and it will cover books 8 through 10 through The Boys. So again, schedule is linked down below as well, um, in addition to the Discord. So would my co-hosts like to introduce themselves, starting with Brother Una? Hello, Brother Una from the Codex Cantina. <laughs> Me? Yeah. Rebel Una, sorry. Yeah, I changed my name, but I know what you meant. <laughs> and we'll go to my other half now. Oh, I'm only half? <laughs> <laughs> I am Grand Crypto. The Grand Crypt Christator. <laughs> yeah, no. The seer of all chapter five. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We shall see. <laughs> all right, let's go down from here. Would you like here. to go, Peg? Oh, Peg. Sure, I'll go. Hi, I'm S Sister Peg. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, hi, I'm from the History Shelf. And... Uh, uh, just loving this this uh, journey through 19th century Russia. I'm finding that a lot of my questions have less to do with literary things than actual like trying to find facts. Because you know I'm a history person, man. I'm just <laughs> I'm all about that. But I'm enjoying it. <laughs> so let's see. I'll pass There's so to... much like philosophical <laughs> stuff. It's hard to not focus on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, go ahead, stuff. Victoria. Sorry. I'm Victoria. My channel is a musical bookworm. And yeah, I don't know how we're going to keep this to an hour because there's so much <laughs> to talk about. It's going to be crazy. <laughs> yes. And possibly argue about. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm just here to okay. drink this time. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do they do in, in, in Congress? I give my time back to the lady. It's oh, all yeah. yours, Victoria. <laughs> yes. Is that King Sue I see there? It sure is. Oh. Got out the special Oop. stuff tonight. Ooh. My drink is King Sue. It, I think proceeds somewhat help out the Chicago 
history museum. Oh. Field museum. I'm not 100% oh, okay. sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it helps out Una. Somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I forgot to put this. So, okay, uh, let us know again in the comments how convincing was Ivan for you? Um, so, first of all, for our first discussion question, I think we should just jump right into it. Would you guys like to discuss the Grand Inquisitor first? Can can, can I kick this off? Can I I want to I want to go through this almost kind of in order because I feel like when we say Grand Inquisitor, to me that that limits us to Book Five Five, right? And Mm I feel personally that I would like to start with book five, four, which is rebellion, which is where Yvonne starts off with his argument. It moves Mm -hmm. into his poem, right? The grand inquisitor, which I, I think are linked and then heads into Zosima and Mm -hmm. right. And I view all three of these as like, that's, that's Dostoevsky's star Wars trilogy, right? Like you, you've got the new (laughs) hope. Okay, you've got you've got your Empire Strikes Back, you know, the Grand Inquisitor. Right. And then you've got the return of the Jedi with with Zosima, you know, the good guys, quote unquote, in Dostoevsky's eyes winning at the end. Did you guys view this as first time readers as kind of like a continuous story? Because I know some people I don't don't think they're talking about this specifically, but as a whole, they're saying like, hey, we took a turn. Right. The book started out in all this comedy and all of a sudden it's like, well, why am I, am I in a philosophy book? Like what just happened? And <laughs> it, so one, did it feel disconnected from the rest of the book? I'd, I'd like to ask you guys. And then two, did it feel like a flow going from five to six? And I guess further from there. Definitely. Yes. Uh, yeah. I I mean, <laughs> it, it made sense to me. It didn't feel disconnected. The only thing that felt a little disconnected to me was when we transitioned to Zosima's backstory, but that also makes sense in the end, like by the time you get through book seven and you kind of see why that's placed there as well. So yeah, it, it made sense to me. And it's funny, I was thinking back to the last live stream and in the last live stream, I, I was like, I feel like I don't know Ivan yet and that I don't understand him as a character. And that, and then we get all that Ivan information. <laughs> we get a lot of how he how he sees the world. So I was excited to get that because I felt like that was missing up till this point in the book. Yep. And so I, yeah, agree. I, I would, I would argue that if you take it as a first time reader and you're reading through the pieces of five and then into six and then into seven, I think it feels a little bit fragmented. I don't think it flows that well from the first four books where it feels very natural of kind of where the story's headed. To me, as a first-time reader, it was jarring five, six, and seven. And now reflecting back upon it, once I have all the knowledge of those three additional pieces and I'm one through seven, then I can see the flow. But as a first-time reader, I don't think it's there. So I, it, I, yeah. yeah, I agree with crypto as a first-time reader. Uh, the first four um, books felt like a story, and then I hit this wall of just didactic teaching and it was um but it was great it was fascinating but it was just instruction and um so with like four or five and then with um zosima's uh chapter the toxin homilies i think um Mm -hmm. yeah so it it did interrupt the flows in my in my view but at the same time i think it is it's filling me in on what these characters are feeling and thinking and what what they're about and I've I've already started a, ch- a, a switch to you know la- last time I said Alyosha was just non interesting to me because he seemed kind of just like a <laughs> who are you toast. dude I believe was your you? Milk? what is your <laughs> 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 milk toast um, I actually I, I I like him a lot more after reading um, books five through seven uh, Alyosha you're saying Alyosha yeah okay mm-hmm. I have more you, of a you liked him more sense. I like him more yes. Yay! <laughs> I, I do. <laughs> so, and then Christy, how did you feel going through these? Initially, I was completely overwhelmed. It took me over a week to read the Grand Inquisitor because <laughs> I was just I was trying to. I I don't know. I just had a really hard time with it, and then like in two days, suddenly it started flowing, and I just read through the whole thing. So I read through it like probably three times in whole, but it was really wow. chunked out for me for a while. <laughs> um, cause I was just struggling with it. Mm-hmm. And 
So, and, but okay. I still didn't really understand what was going on until like this morning. I was still frustrated. I couldn't tell how much Ivan agreed with the Grand Inquisitor or mm. didn't in the Grand Inquisitor section. Um, but you see from the earlier part that you were talking about, Una, that he definitely has some doubts about the faith and they're very strong ones that resonate with a lot of people. Um, and they resonated with Dostoevsky, as I found out reading his bio this morning. He actually had his young, his, he had a dear son die named Alyosha. And so it, it turns out that like the core of this argument is that there is no reason for a good God to allow children to suffer. That was like, like the spine of a lot of what Ivan's um, problems are with the faith. And so, and that was very, uh, that was a very personal objection that Dostoevsky himself had to the faith, even though he was, he did believe in God and he had a strong Russian Orthodox faith. That was something that always bothered him. And all of the headlines in the story, somebody M uh, mentioned in this little chat here that it was very shocking to hear those stories. And those were literally pulled from the headlines. Those were all stories of um, terrible suffering that didn't seem to have any purpose. And so um, he talks a lot about that throughout that section. And that just, I, that really enlightened me in, to, to what was being said here. So I appreciated it a lot more once I understood that. And also once I understood, <laughs> it, it was it was hard for me to get through Ivan. <laughs> essentially, because he's such a strong character, even in the midst of his, you know, telling us, like, lecturing us. He still has such a strong character in this passage to me, um, because it, it, to me, it was almost like he was aligning himself with the devil in the sense that he's playing devil's advocate to his brother, Alyosha. Mm -hmm. um, he he's arguing he's he's it's almost like he's teasing him and it was really hard for me to get through that and understand what was really going on here but um ivan is actually very young and he's just expressing his feelings very strongly which he has never expressed to anyone before about his doubts and the faith so i do appreciate that section a lot more now that i've got the biographies kind of interpretation of it a little bit mm -hmm. um, and that biography actually contains Dostoevsky's commentary on this section that he was sending to his editor as he was writing it um, because he didn't want to be censored. <laughs> so he felt like he had to explain all of this because it was so hard to read. And he kept getting notes back with like question marks in the margin and stuff like that. It's very hard to understand. Um, but I feel like after you've dug through it a lot and you have some context, there's really just so much there. It's just really brilliant. And Zosima's passage after that is like an argument with Ivan's thoughts. That's why it's there. It's mm -hmm. that's Dostoevsky's refutation, which is essentially that there is no reason behind this suffering. You can only take a leap of faith because otherwise you can't believe you, you have to take a leap of faith there that God is ultimately good and loving because there is no reason for children to suffer. So essentially that's the main thrust of the argument. There's a whole lot of other arguments in there that I completely disagreed with on Ivan with, mm -hmm. with Ivan on. Because he like misquotes stuff and like it, it made me mad <laughs> and it was really hard for me to get through my uh he's misquoting stuff kind of feeling and uh he's just teasing his brother. This is all just casuistry, as Faith very astutely put it in the Discord. Thank you so much for your comments in the Discord, Faith. They were very helpful for me. So it took me a while to get through it, but eventually I understand where he's talking about, even though I disagree with Ivan. It's a brilliant section. So those are my thoughts. The, Anybody else want to go? Well, I, I, I just want to note one thing too, Christy, that I, I caught on to. And guess who else is really good at misquoting, misquoting scripture, but turning things slightly, but there's still truth in it. The oh, father of lies. Right. So I was constantly yes. aware of that as I was reading that. It's like, you're slightly misquoting it. There's still truth in it, but you're right. twisting it slightly. It's right. very believable. Exactly. So Very believable. And there's good, there's to the heart works, of it, there's right. truth in there. And it works and it's effective. Because he, starts, it does he starts questioning and doubting. That's it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's I mean, so it's, it's successful. I think that's what's the brilliance of this. This part of the story is you start to see cracks and you start to see them evolve as, as characters, as people, real living, breathing people. Yep. Yes, very much so. So... 
how do you think Yvonne walks away after this? Do you think, do you think this is him just emotionally, passionately, not emotionally, passionately expressing his objections? Or do you think he learned anything from this interaction with his brother? Ivan? I yeah. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Victoria. Oh, no, you're good. Um, I think that Ivan is almost challenging Alyosha to, to respond. I think he's sharing all these things to Alyosha because he genuinely wants to know what Alyosha thinks about all these things. And like, I, I think he's he's looking for an answer to his question of why do bad things happen to good people? And he's like, he's seeking. And that's, I think, I think maybe he, it seemed like they didn't know each other very well. Like they, the book gave the impression that Alyosha and Ivan were maybe a little bit like estranged and didn't really know what was going on with the other, the other brother. And um, yeah, I think he was just genuinely interested to hear what Alyosha would say. And he's looking for someone to speak into what's going on internally. And he's, he's looking for someone I think to help him sift through his thoughts and his view of the world. Yeah, That's I think he's really almost using it. Alyosha as a soundboard, right? Because he's struggling mm -hmm. with his own theological opinions, ideas, and Alyosha is somebody that I think he believes can be honest with him because maybe they don't have uh, a close relationship. It's almost like when you go to a bar and you sit down and spill your heart out to the bartender because it's some random stranger. That's almost what I feel like Mm -hmm. Yvonne is doing here with Alyosha. And it's at a bar too at that too, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. no yeah. <laughs> Nobody would pick that up, but I feel like that that's kind of what he's doing is, is there, there isn't this kindred relationship between these two brothers and they can almost duke it out honestly, because there is nothing really between them uh, except for maybe hate. I don't know if, if that is really prevalent here yet. Is so we, we, I feel like we've talked a lot about how Ivan's probably searching for something in himself in terms of does he believe? I mean, he thinks religion's done good to this world, but at the same time, he can't describe to it because a small amount of suffering isn't worth you know the ticket at the end, which he talks about returning and not going to heaven. Maybe even a little bit of a utilitarianism slam there too that that our boy Dosti likes to do. We saw that in Crime and Punishment, right? Like. A little bit of suffering isn't worth, you know, the, the greater greater happiness, stuff, right? And that's what Yvonne's kind of rec representing a little bit. Do you think, um, how do you think Alyosha reacted to this? Because at one point he talked about, does this person deserve to die? Which, in theory, Alyosha should not agree with, but he did. Right. So, so what is what is happening with Alyosha here with these stories? beginning to show cracks like you know like doubt like in a crypto was saying maybe i mean i'm not sure yet i can't really say what's happening <laughs> with Alyosha. i feel by the end of book seven he's hit a crucible of sorts and he's going to be very different going forward i mean it's promised in the text mm -hmm. but um at that point in time i i still think he's he's receiving all of this information from yvonne and uh, it's really just uh, rocking his world a bit. It's just my take. I don't know. It could be wrong. I, I think, like, he, like every other Dostoevsky character, and, like, Dostoevsky himself is obsessed with the idea of suffering and why it's there. So, yeah, I think definitely he's going to be thinking about that. And it probably will change him somewhat, as we see. Right now, he just seems so pure and spotless. But, you know... The longer you live in the world, the more it's you just see so much suffering. You have to handle it somehow. Or I guess you could try and completely ignore it. I've met people like that, too. But um, if you want to be real and genuine, which I think Alyosha does, he's not trying to put himself in a bubble. Um, I think he's going to have to deal with it somehow. I think it's like with the train scenario, right? Everybody tries to rationalize killing one or killing a hundred. And that's, he's finally come to that. That question has finally been presented to him. And it's the first time that he's having to say, no, you have to choose one or the other. And that brings out a lot of, of Alyusha. And how could God allow this to happen in the world where you have to pick 
bad or worse. And those are the only two options. And he's never seen that before because of his purity and innocence. Mm -hmm. And there's a, the spots starting to appear here on the, you know, perfect lamb. It's almost like he's making, so Felios has perfect faith, right? We talked about how he has this, that's how he processes his world through faith. He's making him face the darkest parts that he doesn't want to of why, if God were all powerful, all benevolent, and all knowing, why would he allow for the suffering of the innocent? Especially, you know, we're going into the Grand Inquisitor, right? Um, we all know that the Grand Inquisitor has kind of got this moment of the the temptations of Christ, right? In terms of the, uh, was it called the three the three offerings in the wilderness? Is that what it's called? The temptations. Yeah. There's, there's the three the three temptations in the wilderness and and part of that is to me rebellion is so much about like you guys have said doubt right like the opposite of faith i guess maybe and the temptations is kind of talking about well jesus was offered these three different offers from from the devil and what makes that story interesting is that he he chose he, free will was a big part of that Right, he chose not to give in to the devils or to tempt God and and have him save him by jumping off the cliff or whatever. And here, Ivan is kind of bringing that out to Alyosha too. Of you have free will, you are choosing almost in a sense a little bit of of death in a sense for the greater good, and Alyosha accepts it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of interesting the way that he's putting these cracks into his own arguments even too. Um, he, the, the four and five, I think he's just really being honest with himself of what are some of the doubts that I have with my own religion in a sense. And, and even arguably, if we're going to bring his religion into it, right? You know, orthodoxy. I mean, we're going to talk about the Pope, right? The Grand Inquisitor. Anyone out there? Am I, am I alone on this one? That that we might have a couple couple shots on Catholicism here. And... Oh yeah, yeah. That's one of my big questions. <laughs> yes. So, so we would have, you like to talk about that, Peg? We've got three three history people here. We got to go into this at some point, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we move. You're into, on. We're moving into chapter five then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> Oh, so my question, obviously, I'm reading it and um, the Grand Inquisitor. And uh, so at first I'm thinking, OK, this is this is the epic scene between the, you know, it's Satan and <laughs> interrogating Jesus. That's what I that's what I read it as. And then mm -hmm. as I was going further into the Inquisition, as it were, then it's moving into now it's now it's talking about the Roman Catholic Church. Then it's talking about the Jesuits. Then it's talking about I want to align with the thinking people, the intelligent people, you know. And so I'm just like, OK, so who let Martin Luther into the room? <laughs> 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 you know, I'm like, OK, um, now, you know, obviously I, you know, I know a lot about Lutheranism just because, you know, I was born into that, you know, faith. I was baptized Lutheran. I don't know much yet about Orthodox, you know, church, but I can only uh, imagine, you know, Una, maybe you can speak to this, that, you know, there's, you know, they're at loggerheads, but, you know, I know that what, how Luther portrayed, he portrayed the Pope as the Antichrist, you know, so, <laughs> and the Society of Jesus was considered like, you know, his, the, the warriors of uh, the Pope, and so I'm just wondering what's going on here from a historical you know, religious, socio, you know, position of what's he, it, at this point in time when Dostoevsky was writing, was there a, a, a big issue? You know, was there a big, in Russia, were they having, okay, you go for that. Right. But <laughs> this, this goes back to our before talk where we're going to go. Okay. So I think the why I think why he's choosing this angle, this is just my opinion. And of course, you know, you've got you know, Christy, I'm sure she's got some biography information. You can look at it from a historical standpoint, like we're going to talk now. You can look at it just from a philosophical angle. Lots of different ways to take this. And I'm not saying anyone's wrong as we go down the history specific angle, right? So you have the way I, I view the historical angle of this is starts back 1054, right? The great, the great schism. You know, we have Catholicism and Eastern Christianity or Western Christianity, however you want to break it, right? 
And one of the big separators of those is, of course, the palpable claims, right? Going back to Peter and that Peter should kind of rule and his descendants mm -hmm. over all other bishops. And that's the big schism is that Rome separates. And you'll notice he makes several references to Rome too. Now, how I took that is Rome was a pagan state before, right? W way before, you know, Christianity kind of it's said literal it. namesake. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, it, 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 Rome became kind of the capital. It was the, the home site for several reasons, one a couple of which were there's two major martyrs that were, you know, killed in Rome. And it became kind of the, the palpal seat, I guess. Um, I'm not sure I'm using the right term there. And I think what he's doing is making a callback to the whole religion versus not, you know, pagan state versus, you know, a, it became a, a Christian state, Catholic, Catholic state. And what's happening in Russia at the time is the argument of, you know, we've lived what, thousand years under orthodoxy here? And all of a sudden, there's all these movements starting in, you know, crypto talks about the grassroots movements of atheism, of socialism coming in. Are they the same thing? Hey, I'm not going to make that argument here. This isn't the live stream for that, right? But Dostoevsky ties them together very strongly is the point, right? And he views that this is very dangerous for our country, our being Russia, to reopen that door to entering into an atheistic state. And what he's doing is kind of calling out some of the issues that Rome has, that, that Rome had even, and how what the Grand Inquisitor is representing in this, in this interpretation of this is he's taking away the free will. He's saying, people, just trust me. We're all going to die. We're all suffering, and there's nothing we can do about it but at least the church can make you comfortable in this. Give up your free will, which was the original, I, what's the right term here? I don't want to say gift, but the original option that human beings chose was free will. And by submitting to, you'll notice there's also a lot of master-servant commentary here, which of course you can go to serfdom if you want, but also in terms of submitting to your true master in Christianity is of course God. Jesus, right? And here they're calling out some of the palpal claim issues with the Pope being the new master, the one that's making these claims that aren't in scripture. And I think he's kind of taking some shots at that to show some of the issues when you give up your free will, when you when you give into things like this and enter potentially some of the pagan state things that Rome had gone through is, is one interpretation for it. I think to kind of sum it up, what it does is it adds this level of mythology to Christianity because so many other religions, you go back to the pagan states, they're, they're myth at this point in time. They're thousands of years old. And this gives an element of mysticism to spirituality. And I think he's trying to say, you know, how you feel is how other people felt about their religion. And this split is, is this man-made problem. And for me, religion can't fix man-made problems. Well, is, is it even the split kind of a man-made problem, right? Like, yeah, we, we have one scripture, but then we're, we're, we're splitting up our churches because man has different interpretations, different ways of taking it. Um, in terms of the palpal claims, in terms of the filioque, uh, you had some of the, you, you had, after that in like 1200s and 1500s, you had two attempts at a union and they said, okay, okay, we'll, we'll accept the filioque, but they don't follow it. And then eventually they just go back to doing what they were before. And these are all, these are all our interpretations of it. If, if you take a, a theological view of this, where you assume scripture is real, then, then the scripture doesn't change. The word of God doesn't change. What changes is how man interprets it is one way to, I think, look at it from a theological perspective. And of course, man is flawed by original sin, and that's kind of brought in there too as we move forward after this. What's brought up right afterwards? Bam! <laughs> we start seeing the idea of Fjordr and the original sin on the brothers, and they start acknowledging it for the very first time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to share some of 
the thoughts in the comments because we have some very good observations in here. Faith has actually prevented, presented several things that would be great to talk about. So um, first of all, there's their most recent comment. God gave us free will so that we can love what Ivan is presenting is not actual teaching, but his warped view of things. I was reading the chat, so I couldn't listen super closely to what you guys were saying, but it is, it, does that add any comments to what you were saying? Do you have any thoughts on that? I think Una just kind of said that. It uh, depends okay. on whether you're looking at it from a theologian aspect or not. Right. And it really mm -hmm. it identifies, again, you, as we've said so many times, of what is your personal belief or faith. That's going to come out of how you feel about chapter five and the brothers at the end. Right. I, I would love to see an argument of which one somebody thinks is Christ and which one thinks somebody thinks which one is Satan. <laughs> <laughs> to talk about that too. So, so what and I think crypto represented me pretty well there that, you know, if you're looking at it from of religion is true, which, which I'm not saying do or don't, I'm just saying that's one way to have the lens when you're looking at this. Another way to look at it is everything's on the table. And one of the, the, the common philosophical arguments, and, and it's going to go in a circle. Like when I present these arguments, it's not like, Hey, I'm stopping here. This proves religion is or isn't true. Like it, it goes in a, a circle. I could, I could build the circle out for you. But the argument against love is okay. So if we assume that a universal love exists because God put it there, what, what is the point of, um, That, that, that's kind of I, Yvonne's argument in a sense is there is no love in the suffering of, of innocence, right? So they think that it's free will and they think that they submit to the authority, but well, hang on, let me, let me think about this a little bit longer. Someone else take over here. I need to reformulate my argument here. Cause I'm actually arguing for faith again, accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I'm wishing now that I had been able to like, Go. I wish I hadn't paid more attention now to Zosima's chapter because I feel like that would really um, have a lot to say on this. It's that's so Zosima's chapter kind of presents Dostoevsky's like more innate view of things, even though Ivan's view is something he resonates with so strongly because he hates that innocent people suffer. Um, so I feel like Zosima, Zosima. Uh, Zosima. <laughs> Crime um, oh, finding a yeah. here. <laughs> there's even like a Katarina and like there's so many similar characters, but um There's only so many Russian names to pick from, Christy. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> oh my goodness. So okay. So um I thought Faith mentioned this too, which was interesting. Um to her, the problem of evil to innocent children is a lot more compelling argument against God's existence than the Grand Inquisitor, which seemed very contrived and pretentious to her. So I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. I feel well, like that's what he's ultimately trying to get to in that well, section, but and there's a lot of other stuff. And what's interesting with Zosima's reply to that, which I think is kind of his, is Dostoevsky's interpretation of, of the reply to that, is basically active love, right? If you give love to others, that is the truest form of, of being, right? Is, is loving others. And in a sense, the, the, the philosophical response to that is, but why do you need God to love? Is there such a thing as universal love? Can, can an atheist still love? You know, would, would, is there other forms of love if you don't have God as one of the, one of the counter arguments? I'm not saying that's a perfect counter argument, but that's something that an atheist would potentially argue with is, I don't need God to love is what they would argue. Well, I think the kiss is the symbolic, the symbolic gesture to, to support that claim, right? The kiss at the end where he indicates, Hey, there's problems in the church. There's problems with people. People have problems and question their faith. And I have no response to that. And he just kisses him and, mm -hmm. and acknowledges, you know, that, all right, I, I, I get that. There are issues with no reasonable response. Is it's a, yeah, I think that's a good that's a good point, crypto. And then also the Zosima's reply, what Dostoevsky's reply is, is that we have to love. That doesn't solve what some people's question is, but why do we have to have this natural suffering or people who have no free will, you know, to to faith point, basically the rebellion arguments, though though the the idea that we love is what Yvonne's argument is to kind of flip it is that this is comforting us 
but it doesn't actually solve or answer why would an all-powerful, all-benevolent God allow suffering of people with no free will and cause natural harm in a sense. And then the scripture response, of course, is, well, we don't understand God's design. Like we, we go in a very big circle around it, but they're all very valid arguments as to, you're right, we can actively love Zosimu, but that doesn't answer why we have to have this suffering. It, the, there's no reason for me to have those duties of this love. And I think that's what Yvonne is, is arguing is, I believe in, I think, to me, Yvonne's kind of like right now at this point in the book, is that that platonic moralist, right? He believes there is a universal love, that it that doesn't have to be God-created love. There can be a universal love for humans. Active love, yeah. Active love. But he returns his ticket to God because he doesn't need God's view of that. He thinks that allowing some suffering violates that rule. A little bit violates the lot of it. And I think so that's just argument back to okay. that is free will, right? Right. Right. And then and, and that's not about, God's fault. It's man's fault. And then we and go in the circle, real. right? The, yeah. the <laughs> Back we go. The Vaughn, it's so know, complex. It's like yeah. we would have to like seriously really do some incredible breakdowns here. I so it breaks just brains. <laughs> it, it really does. Because it's like it's like one of the questions at the center of the universe. <laughs> oh yeah. So um, I just wanted to share a quick quote about this section that was in the biography. I'm going to try and screen share it for you guys um, because I just thought it was so interesting. The um, only thing he could have done more to throw in this chapter is who created God. <laughs> like right. it doesn't go much deeper than that. And like, I'm surprised he didn't try to cram it in there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the legend of the... So this is a quote from the biography with direct quotes from Dostoevsky, and then somebody else wants to hear what other panel members have to think. So I would love to hear after this. Um, <laughs> Victoria, sorry. <laughs> I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, so not on this quote, I mean on the conversation as a whole. Okay. Um, so the one quote is, the legend of the Inquisitor, he added, was directed... This is... Dostoevsky writing to his editor. He's commenting on the Grand Inquisitor. The legend of the Inquisitor was directed against Catholicism and the papacy, and particularly the period of the Inquisition, which had such awful effects on Christianity and on all of humanity. Even though Dostoevsky said nothing about socialism in these remarks, both socialism and Catholicism have become identical identical for him as embodiments of the first and third temptations of Christ, the betrayal of Christ's message of spiritual freedom in exchange for bread and the aspiration towards earthly power. So part of his argument is, you know, <laughs> people are, uh, the way of Christ looking at things is it gives humanity too much credit. Really all humans want is bread and to be told that there's a universal thing that everybody really believes. So, um, let me just get rid of that. And then Victoria, please, please tell us your thoughts on this whole thing. On this particular quote? No, on, on all of it so far. We haven't heard from you very much. <laughs> Sorry, that's so broad. But do you have thoughts on the Grand Inquisitor and the chapter before and Zosima's um, chapter afterwards or any of what we've said? So, well, okay. Going back before we were talking about the quote then, so talking about um, Alyosha's response to, I, to Yvonne. I keep calling him Ivan. I'll say Yvonne. I feel like that's more appropriate. That's more correct, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whatever, so, whatever you want. <laughs> um, I thought it was really interesting how Alyosha is like Dostoevsky really uses his silence to parallel a lot of like, it just made me think of when Christ is silent in the Bible and like Christ is like listening or he's not responding when people are asking him to respond. And I, it's almost like, like Alyosha wants Ivan to, to voice things and he wants the opinion to be sounded. Um, but also like there is no kind of like what we were talking about. There is no answer to some of these questions that Yvonne has that we as humans can can figure out like there is no easy answer to any of these things and instead that's where the whole kiss comes in where after we hear the story of the grand Inquis inquisitor 
and how this Christ figure in the story like gets up and kisses the Grand Inquisitor. And then uh, we see Alyosha also do this to Ivan. And, you know, it's it's kind of like, it smacks you in the face with like the symbolism, but it's, it's Alyosha um, kind of, I think, giving Ivan what Ivan might actually be asking for. And that's like, just like compassion and maybe just someone to listen and, um, like we, you, and I think Christy might have mentioned this, like faith overcoming, like there's no answer other than like taking a leap of faith. You know, there's no like logical, intelligent answer. It's, um, there, there's, there's like a heart answer mm -hmm. that we can only, we can give each other when we can't give each other like a logical answer. We can, we can love people and we can like choose to um, love people with like the place that they're at and the things that they're struggling with at that time. But um, we don't have to offer an answer all the time. That's, that's what was 100%. <laughs> well said. Yes. Well said. Was that I, also what you wanted to talk about with the kiss parallels, Victoria? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool, that was great. <laughs> I, I think that quote that you pulled out, Christy, um, from the biography, um, oh yeah, yeah. It, that, that I just wanted to mention too. It resonated with me when I was reading it. I could tell during that chapter. Um, I can't. Ex I can't remember exactly where it's at. Okay, but um, I did. I did recognize when he was saying, "You could have chosen bread, you know, to give bread, but you chose that. You know, free will is more important, or or freedom, right?" Mm -hmm. Um because the Grand Inquisitor is saying uh, essentially that, and I agree with this. I think that people are essentially afraid of being free. And I mean, spiritual freedom. That's terrifying. If you think about it, if you just really meditate on that, what does it mean to be absolutely free? You know, I mean, it means whoa. figure it out yourself, which is scary. <laughs> and you are fully accountable. Right. So, when faced with that choice, people would rather be, I'd rather be taken care of, fed, and just tell me what to think, you know, and, and then I, you know, I'll go with it. Um, because true freedom is very, very scary. It's terrifying. At the end of this, I remember reflecting back upon thinking uh, when I had a discussion in, uh, I went to a Catholic college, and I remember the father my, my professor was a father and he brought us to this dilemma and it was a, a priest doing philosophy. And it was very strange because he presented this question with us. Did God create the sun on the fourth day or the first day? And he said, it doesn't matter because we don't know how long a day is to God. And mm -hmm. I kind of feel like that that encapsulates this. And I thought about that as I finished this, I was like, mind blown. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, and I tell my students stuff like that all the time, these mind bending questions. And they're just like, wait a minute, my brain hurts now. I don't like you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, it is mind blowing. Continuously, as my Voxer friends will attest today. <laughs> I don't have Voxer, um, so I don't have friends, I guess. Oh, I just there's some philosophy for you. <laughs> and if we, friends. <laughs> yes, definitely. We're your friends, crypto. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> but you're just my steam yard, stream yard. <laughs> We're just stream yard friends. Just well, yard you friends. have a friend in the chat who knows you in real life, and that is Leslie. Oh, yeah. Speaking of which, have you but experienced favorite, the Leslie so hug? That doesn't matter. Oh. <laughs> Favorites uh. over there. <laughs> okay, so I feel like there were so many amazing comments in here. Um, somebody mentioned that Faulkner also liked to misquote scripture. There are so many parallels, and we talked about this in the Discord too, between like Southern literature and russian literature it's crazy it's it's insane and if you guys have anything to say 
please say it <laughs> while I <laughs> am looking. Oh, the Russians are known for their focus on suffering and pain. Yeah. I would say that's true. They well, really they deal with the deep stuff of life. <laughs> they do. And this book or these these chapters, especially in these, in these books, have reminded me of my love of the book of Job which I, I, I've studied the book of Job yes. and that is the book on suffering and why do things happen? Why do bad things happen to, you know, good people, bad people, whatever. It's just, I mean, Job got the, the, you know, he got, he got it thrown at him. And what I love about the book of Job is essentially at one point, God says to Job, where were you when I was like forming the heavens and the earth and laying out the foundations, you know, and, and then Job was just like put back in his place. He's like, oh, yeah, that's right. I'm talking to the creator of the universe here, <laughs> you know. So um, I guess for me, as I'm reading, I, I'm just coming back to that answer. Like you really, you know, and to speak to what crypto said about, you know, what what is a day to God? You know, how can we possibly know the mind of God? We can't. So, again, leap of faith. That is what faith means. You won't have all the answers. Um, so either you choose to go that route and take the leap or you stick to uh, why do these things happen? I can't abide it. And I turn I, I turn my ticket back in. You know, I don't want it. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple choice. It's one or the other, I guess. Kind of reminds me in a different light. Do, have you ever heard of the puddle argument? No, I don't think so. It's It's imagine you're a puddle and you wake up one day. And, and there's a hole around you and you, you perfectly fill up this hole. Hey, this, this hole was made for me. This is, this is the perfect hole for me as a puddle. I fit perfectly in this hole. And, mm -hmm. and it, it, it's made for a different argument, but it, for, from a creation argument perspective of, you know, of the perfect creation. But it, it's true of us humans, too, where we're so limited in our view. You know, for how many years did we think the earth was flat? Only to find out, oh, my gosh, we're actually round wait a minute, we're not at the center of the universe. I thought this was a human centric universe. Like we learn so much that sometimes that we have this puddle analogy failure where we think everything fits perfectly, but that's just because that's what we see and what we're experienced to. When you have a much broader or different view, you can see things differently and just be like, no water expands to fill up that hole, Mr. Puddle. That's why you fill up that hole perfectly. Like it kind of reminds me of that, of we're very limited in what we can, what we can experience. Excellent. I think historically, I kind of think of this too as, you know, Dostoevsky is a, a major opponent and proponent for both, you know, religion, faith, whatever. And I think that if you tie this back uh, historically to Russia, Russia has always been, you know, a very class society. And the czars had ultimate power authority, like many other cultures throughout history. And these cultures, you know, the leaders were designed to be leaders by God. And you see all these parallels and th this power of faith is instilled into these leaders. And he's questioning this because these leaders have dominated these people's lives, you know, for 900 years. And now they're starting to question it. And he's starting to question it. Am I an opponent or proponent of, you know, faith, or in this case, these, these czars that have this ultimate, uh, you know, power over these people. And uh, it, it, it takes him down this winding road of, of good versus evil. And I know that sums up a little bit too simply, but I, I think that a lot of it is him, as you can attest to, Christy, in his biography of, of what he's going through personally in Russia at the time and what he's viewing through Russian history to kind of bring it back to the idea that Russians are only about, you know, suffering. Well, they live very difficult lives because of what has been put on them for centuries that, that, that never went away and it went away in most of other parts of the world as they evolved into these very simple democracies. Russia didn't. It, it, it still to this day, it struggles with its own identity and it still struggles with, you know, a true representative democracy. History That's lesson a really over. good point. Yeah, no, Class that was dismissed. great. <laughs> <laughs> Don't that be tardy awesome. to second block. <laughs> so should we talk okay. about... I see a couple comments about the onion. We haven't talked about the onion yet, yes. which would probably be one of my other favorite yes. parts. Well, what did you guys think about that part? What were, what were your interpretations on it? Victoria Peg. Yeah, go Victoria Peg. Peg. Hey. Go Victoria. 
Go <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I, I thought it was, I thought it was uh, very touching in the sense that, you know, I, I guess I, I don't know if I got as much from it as everyone else did is, I mean, was it just to say that I gave an onion to a, a, a you know, I gave a small thing. It's like, okay. It's like the widow with the mite who gives the, that's all she has left to give for the church and it's just that's a that's a biblical reference you know she gives her last and remaining and she gave more in the eyes of god than the person who gave thousands of their excess rich riches right so in this case is it just saying um i did this one small act of kindness and generosity and that's all i mean that's 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 you're in you're in with god <laughs> tell me what you guys think Christy. Okay. Well, I, I'll just share my thoughts on the parable and maybe I can answer your question, Peg. Um, so I thought the onion was just a fable expressing the uh, spiritual revelation that Grushenka had. Um, you know, she, and this is in the section where she and Alyosha are talking and yeah. they both have this, they, their souls are shaken. The Pavir and Volkonsky translation says the Constance Garnett one says something about their spirits um, having like some kind of revelation and how that's not very common in your life. And they just have this moment of connection where it really shakes them. And I think that's, that is um, when Alyosha is giving the onion, you know, um, to Grushenka. So I think it's symbolic of her revelation. Um, the she knew the story. Oh, she, so she knew the story by heart. I'm trying to like read my scrawled notes. Sorry. <laughs> um, so she, she knew the story by heart and she kind of always told it to herself, I think. And she always just identified with the wicked woman in the story who's in hell. Um, and, but now, now she's saying that without pride, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm the wicked one in that parable. Um, yeah. And so I think Alyosha kind of gives her a different view of herself. And somebody in the chat mentioned the first miracle. Is that the first miracle you're talking about? That he complete, like, just by offering her the onion, she had a complete revelation about herself and about her potential as a spiritual person. And I, I think going off to marry the man, is that supposed to be like a good development in her life? It was like a little bit unclear to me. So that was my thoughts. Yeah, I was confused. <laughs> the, the whole Grushenka thing she kind of really threw me because she sounded just hysterical I'm going to take this to the simplest terms possible <laughs> Shrek taught us about onions they have layers <laughs> Grushenka right. has layers and I'm going quite a bit of change here and I think we start to see some of those layers being peeled away. And I know you can take it the fun religious parable stuff, but that's way too serious. Come yeah. on, people. <laughs> no. Grushenka's like onion. They have layers. <laughs> but everybody likes cake. I don't even like onions. My wife doesn't like cake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and just briefly, I wanted to say too, um, so they said that Starscream Live said he was referring to Jesus's first miracle, which is the water into wine. So that was referenced in here a lot. The, oh, the section is called like. Cana of Galilee. That I and... really like. That shed a lot of light. I never really actually looked. <laughs> Dostoevsky did a big favor for me here because I never really looked at that miracle as what he portrayed it as, which was wonderful. Like he was also here to bring joy and not just the saving mission. You know, it was just like just the little tiny things like. He was also here to like reinforce the fact that we are supposed to be joyful and, and contribute to each other's joy. And so that was just really, I, I liked his interpretation of the miracle of Cana. They knew we were alcoholics even back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Victoria, did you have any thoughts on like that section at all? The onion or like it was like the start of Alyosha's ministry i feel like at the end it's like jesus going off i feel like that was a really strong parable in there uh par parallel excuse me um did you have any thoughts about that section to be i i read the last part of this section way too fast so i'm trying to remember i'm like what was the parable 
<laughs> oh, I, I just read it really fast, but um, I I know like Grushenko was a character who like I I thought I thought was was just like a I don't know was like kind of a a, a bad character who we weren't we weren't supposed to like like or identify with, and now I'm now I I see Grushenko like Grushenko is one of the more the more interesting women so far. The women I have a complaint, Dostoevsky. The women in this <laughs> book are not super interesting. Like they're very flighty and fickle and emotional and, and drama queens. Sorry, drama queens. <laughs> <laughs> like, like women are clearly I don't know maybe not the focus of the book. I could be wrong, um, but Grushenko though she has she has layers like an onion, and I appreciate that <laughs> at least about mm -hmm. Grushenko. And I and I enjoyed the the section with her and um, her just kind of going from like she doesn't value herself very highly at all. And then after um, interacting with Alyosha, I think she see maybe starts to see herself in a different way, kind of like what you're saying, Christy. So I was like, oh, good, a, a female character with some depth. <laughs> and I <laughs> I could probably will put my. I'm putting my foot in my mouth probably and maybe the female characters have a lot more depth than I noticed, but <laughs> yeah. I think it's totally cool to share your thoughts and, and, and feelings on it. I've definitely, I've definitely noticed that, that a lot of his females are kind of hysterical. I do feel like they have depth, but we just don't get that much focus on them. It's kind of like all the characters in the beginning of the story. We were all like, do we even know these people? Like who even are they? Um, we would have like initial like impressions. Oh, I think I'm gonna like this person. I'm gonna like Alyosha because he's Winnie the Pooh. But like, we don't really get to know him. It's even more so that with the women. Like, we just don't really get to know them very well. We see like how they are on a on a. It's more depth than I could get if I lent you know five pages to a woman. Like, there's way more depth there than I could give a woman in five pages. But she still only gets five pages. You know. Mm -hmm. You're expecting a 19th century Russian dude to be woke? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ain't happening, ladies. I didn't yeah. say anything more, but... <laughs> I understand. I understand. Yeah. To be fair, though, I think, and I agree with everything you said, but I would also add on to it that he does make the men pretty hysterical at points, too. That's true. That's very true. That, that right. he, he definitely is providing a lot of depth to it. And what we choose to focus on, I think, is important. And uh, Grushenko's story is it's un it's still unfolding. There, there's more to come with the, the women play a bigger role. I'm not saying <laughs> still 19th century dude. <laughs> 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 but there is there's more to unravel here with with the women as as we go into these next few chapters. Okay, I assume so. I know it's hard to. That's exciting. It's hard to talk into it halfway through the book, I'm sure. <laughs> well, and, and I'm not saying that they get the spotlight or that they're great. Uh -huh. I'm not disagreeing. I'm just saying there will be more of them, though. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Well, and hopefully, too, we'll see um, a little bit more of the uh, Madame Koklakov types that could 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 speak without gasping and fainting with vapors <laughs> so many it was just the way he wrote their 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 dialogues i think that really kind of put me off as far as krushenka and and katarina too it's just the over oh, oh, you know that kind of thing whereas mm -hmm. madame koklikov could at least just be very upfront and just you know speak that's all yeah. i'm looking for <laughs> just some some calm discussions <laughs> well, he doesn't get any more calm no no Okay, <laughs> People complain about this with Ra uh, Radia as well from Crime and Punishment that he was just so all over the place all the time. Like he's here yeah. and he's there, and it's wildly different. And I feel like the women kind of are like that a lot of, but like every what I've already saying, like all the characters get that treatment a little bit. Yeah. It's part of Dostoevsky's style and his message, and I'm just not sure I understand it yet. Hopefully, one day. <laughs> Now, before we get going, we have to hear everyone's predictions about what's going to happen. Uh, not everyone. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Let's hear <laughs> Peg's and Victoria's predictions. <laughs> now, the butler when you did say, it. yeah, well, okay, so <laughs> predictions, are you talking about the upcoming? 
Yeah, the the upcoming section. Is this what we're talking about? Okay. Yeah. All right, here's my prediction. So I thought it was very odd when Ivan went back home, had that that run in with Smerdyakov, and uh, he was feeling this empty anguish in his soul. Okay. I'm just saying, I feel like when he went to bed, he was in the same house as Fyodor. They're in the same house. And I, I felt like he, he went to bed and he mentioned he's had some, t- he kind of felt like he was in a daze and he kind of walked around the house and was listening to Fyodor rambling around the rooms. And then the next day he wakes up and he goes to Moscow or whatever. I think he was in a, like a weird state. He could have killed him. Mm. You're saying, you're saying who? Uh, oh? You're saying who? Yvonne. 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 Okay. I'm still going with my first prediction from the last live stream. I, just that's when you say he, idea. I need clarity on the pronoun when you say he, because I don't want to say. Okay, that's right, to... Yvonne, because I'm just saying just because he was in, he was in proximity, and then he had a weird, <clears throat> I felt like I was floating, I don't, or no, he felt like he wasn't there, Yvonne wasn't all there, he was hearing things in the night. I don't know, I think something could have happened. Interesting. Victoria, I'd like to know what you think. I have a few, okay. I have a few different things I'm playing with. So either because Grushenka is is in this little love triangle, right? With the with Theodore and um Dimitri. And we haven't seen from Dimitri for, for a while either. So I'm I'm thinking to myself, what if Grushenka is the one who kills Theodore because she wants like she wants out of this like awkward love triangle thing, <laughs> <laughs> and she's just like I don't know, she just kills one so that she can just be with the other. I like Ooh, it. here's a prediction too. Yes. Oh my goodness, that was one I never thought of, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about female empowerment. Yeah. I have a agency. Agency. That's probably not. I don't know. It could be though. I don't the poster know. child is the murderer. <laughs> <laughs> ring, 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 ring. That's Victoria's desire because then the story would like shift onto Grushenka and she'd be like really interesting. Like, maybe that's what uh, I want. Fits your narrative. <laughs> I'm projecting my own narrative. <laughs> <Your> narrative. <laughs> She's like, I want to see more women taking control here. <laughs> So that stab so we have... fits this knife perfectly. <laughs> I'm gonna just all over this place. Yeah. Get the so we have some predictions coming in too. Oh, There's Alyosha is too innocent and pure. Dostoevsky has to be setting him up to be tarnished in some way. He needs some sort of stain on his pureness. That is another thought that I have is that it's going to be Alyosha and it'll be a surprise to okay. the reader, you know? So huh, maybe. Now, Christy, do you know at this point? Can you play the guessing game, or have you read far, far enough ahead that you know what's going to happen? I haven't. I haven't read further, but I may. I just may have been spoiled oh. by reading the biography. I don't. I'm not uh, sure, one hundred percent. But hmm. there was a comment in there that made me think. Ooh, okay, I well, wonder. Let's, so let's hold back then. Let's hold back then. We yes, I'm going to hold back. So that's why I don't read introductions to these books because I don't <laughs> want the plot spoiled. And I know in, in introductions they give you the whole breakdown about what everything means. And I'm like, you just spoiled the story. I hate. <laughs> yeah. Well, crypto. Do you think this time reading through it, it'll end the same way as you you read it last time? <laughs> I believe that we might get a bait and switch. No. Oh, all right. Oh. All right. <laughs> Oh. I say no, nothing more. It could change. I might get a different translation. They switch one of the names up on me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I will tell you this. He has a Russian name. Wow. Or she has a Russian name. Oh, that narrows it down. <laughs> now, Christy, when, when is the next live chat? Is it in two weeks or three weeks from now? Yes, we should probably get going. We're already five minutes over. There's lots of great comments. Thank you so much, you guys, for your comments. Um, I really appreciate yes. hearing them. Let hang you on. You said the 18th me. at the top of the hour, right? Uh, should yeah, uh, let me hang on. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, so this is our ending of the third live stream. So the next one will be the fourth live stream, and in the meantime, we will be in the Discord. So if you want to chat with us more and share your thoughts, please do. 
Um, it's linked in the description again. And definitely subscribe to all of my wonderful co-hosts. Um, they're, they're all doing wonderful things. Victoria put together a playlist and Peg just bought some very exciting books about Dostoevsky. <laughs> so you got to check that out. And also. Crypto and Uno just did a, like a summary of books one through four and discussion. So that definitely awesome. check that out. Mm -hmm. um, our next live stream will be on March 18th at 7 p.m. EST, same time as this one was. Um, and that one will cover books eight through 10 through the boys. So schedule, playlists, and discords and their channels, all of them are linked down below. So yeah, we're, we'll let you guys go. Um, thank you so much for coming and thank you so much to my co-host. This was so fun. Thanks guys. See you in three weeks.